Welcome, everyone. My name is David Olson. I'm a senior here at Iowa State in economics, and I'm the president of the Young Americans for Liberty chapter here at Iowa State. On behalf of Iowa State University, the Committee on Lectures, the Iowa Campaign for Liberty, and Young Americans for Liberty, I'd like to welcome you all to tonight's lecture by former presidential candidate and 11-term congressman, Dr. Ron Paul. It's a huge honor for our group to be hosting this event tonight. Um, 2008 sparked a huge revolution in college campuses across America, um, a movement toward freedom and free markets and limited constitutional government. And Dr. Paul has done more than any other person in politics in, in spreading these messages to young people in America. And I thank him for that, and it's a great honor to have him here tonight. And this is definitely evidenced by this amazing turnout tonight, more than we expected. I'm sorry for everyone that's sitting upstairs watching on a video projector, but um, it's amazing that you all turned out. Thank you. If any Congressman Ron Paul is an 11-term Republican in the House of Representatives. In 2008, he ran as a presidential candidate for the Republican Party, and his, his run st uh, started a revolution across America. He was a flight surgeon in the U.S. Air Force and a doctor by trade, delivering over 2,000 babies. Today, he is the honorary chairman of the Campaign for Liberty and the champion of the Constitution. We are privileged to have Congressman Paul here today, and it's my pleasure to introduce him to you all. Ladies and gentlemen, Congressman Ron Paul. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, and I can't even shoot a basketball either, so <laughs> thank you for coming. I appreciate this very much. I appreciate all the comments made and the introduction, so it's uh, great to be here. It's uh, great to come back, and, uh, but it's great to be on the campuses of, uh, of America because I've been going there uh, since the campaign was over, and the receptions have been good, and that encourages me. A lot of people during the campaign said that I encourage them and I remove their apathy, but to tell you the truth, when I meet with young people and uh, we communicate, all of a sudden I get a little of encouragement too because the problems aren't all that easy to solve, and uh, I talk a lot about the problems, but most of the people come away thinking that uh, they have a feeling of optimism once you know what the problems are and what we should do. So I am, I am very grateful for your interest and your participation, and I'm very glad to be here uh, this evening. You know, last week we had a little bit of activity. I'm sure you noticed that uh, there was a bill passed late Saturday night, close to midnight, and uh, we, we, were, we were taking good care of you. Well, you know, we're going to give you free medical care. <laughs> You know, you talk about loss of credibility. They come along and the administration makes this proposal, we're going to put everybody under care and we're going to take care of this and it's not going to cost anything. Not only will it not cost anything, we're actually going to lower the deficit by this new program, which is going to cost a trillion dollars. That's what they said is going to cost a trillion dollars. But if you go back and look at all the medical programs the government has been involved in, it always costs two or three or four times more than they had originally said. So I, sugge I suggest that that's exactly what will happen. Now, will the quality of care go up? Obviously not. The costs will go up, certainly, and taxes will go up, and it would lead to nothing but problems. Now, this is pretty important because uh, you as young people will have to deal with this. Uh, you have to deal with your own life and taking care of your medical needs. At the same time, you, gotta, you have to deal with this runaway government that thinks it can provide medical care for everybody. Now, just, just think about it. Uh, you know, recently we've been hearing about the H1N1 uh, flu scare. And uh, it's a serious disease. As a physician, I, I know about this, and, uh, and I can't belittle it. But I do object to overblowing it at times. 
you know, here we have, and, but what my strongest objection is that the government has taken over making all the decisions. You know, in a free society, the patient makes a lot of decisions along with his or her doctor. But here, when the government takes over, they have the program. So they get a couple billion dollars, and they're in charge of the distribution of the, of the vaccine. So you, you go into New York, there's a bunch of people that don't want it. They're forced to take it. You go to another state, they want the, the flu vaccine. They can't get it. And uh, this is a typical example of how government uh, operates. And uh, we're, we're very much involved in medical care already. When you look at uh, uh, what we do on Indian reservations, quality of care there is not all that great. If you go to the veterans hospital and the veterans care, that's not all that great. They can't distribute a, a vaccine. And what we want to do is turn the whole process over, uh, over to the government. But that's a typical example of what happens. And uh, fortunately, though, I think there's a ways to go on that medical bill. It's, uh, it's not going to sail through. And I thought it was uh, rather interesting that uh, one, the biggest controversy had to do with the abortion issue. And uh, there were 60 Democrats that voted against the idea of taking money from a group of people who are strongly opposed to abortion and paying the other ones to do abortion. And the uh, ones, the uh, the pro pro abortion members said they'll vote for it just to get something out uh, before uh, before we take a break. But they'll come back and they said it won't be on final passage. So that means there's a lot of infighting. The Senate has to deal with it. And the the plain truth is there's just no money anymore. And that's why they're up against the wall on this. Uh, but they're not quite ready to admit. What I think many of you already know, that this country is bankrupt and there will have to be cutbacks and there has to be limitation. And unfortunately for you, it's falling on your generation uh, to make these decisions because I can't promise you a whole lot from the people I know in Washington, they're solving your problems. And the likelihood of that happening in the near future, not very good. And it doesn't seem like changing administrations helps a whole lot. You know, we went from the liberals to the conservatives and the Republicans, and they doubled the size of the Department of Education. And then they, uh, then they went and had prescription drug program. Then we have uh, a new administration that's supposed to end the war. And what do we do? We double the size of the war, expand the war, and go into more countries. So there's not a good sign that there, the people there are going to change, uh, change policy at all. But eventually, though, it'll have to change because when a country goes bankrupt, which we're on the verge of doing, we're act technically uh, insolvent. We're not bankrupt until the dollar absolutely quits working. And it's not working all that well right now. And one of the bellwethers for that is the price of gold. It tells you what the future of the dollar is going to be. And uh, the price of gold is going up, which means the value of the dollar is going down. That used to be a big event, but it just occurs steadily.